The Pokemon franchise, much like Pokemon themselves, has had its art evolve throughout the years in many different mediums, starting from the humble beginnings of watercolor to the ink and paint of animation cells, ending with our current era of digital art. I'm Doc Shoddy, and in this video, I'm going to be breaking down the art styles of Pokemon. This is Art Stylist. My challenge for this episode is simple. It involves drawing two characters, a unique trainer and their unique Pokemon, or a fake mon, from scratch. As they jump into each new art style, time will go by and the Pokemon will grow and evolve alongside their trainer. If you enjoy this video and you want to see more, subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more art style related content. Now let's jump right in. The first art style I'll be covering is what I call the scanned art style, or what's known to fans as Ken Sugimori's watercolor style. This is what most people picture when they think of the first generation of Pokemon games, but this style can also apply to the second generation. What makes this art style interesting, however, is that it's purely accidental. The high contrast between the colors and the shading, along with its particular use of white balance, is the result of the type of scanner used to preserve the art. Fortunately for us, it unintentionally brought us one of the most iconic art styles in gaming history. To show Cases are Sal, let's introduce our Pokemon trainer and starter duo. All of Pokemon's early art was drawn physically on paper, with ink being used for the line work. Because we're working with digital programs, we have the ability to simulate the tools that were used in real life. In this specific case, we'll be mimicking the look of the brush pen. The line weight or line thickness for this art style is going to be a medium weight that fluctuates slightly as the line moves along the canvas. To fluctuate means to change at random intervals. This is something that happens in real life with a brush, because you never know just how much ink is contained within the tip. A small thing I want to teach you guys that will make your lines look a bit more natural looking involves the intersections and the tangents of the line. When two lines cross, that's an intersection. When a line branches off another, it's a tangent. Let's focus on intersections. Imagine drawing an X on your canvas. Those four corners that meet in the middle, round those corners. It's a subtle thing, but it's easy to do and it makes your line work look more inky. Do the same with your tangents and any sharp corner of your drawing. Now that we have our line work, it's time to jump into color. The very first thing we're going to do is fill the entire drawing with the color white. We'll basically be highlighting the entire drawing before adding color. Color-wise, using our fake mon as an example, I've taken my palette from Spiro. More specifically, colors from the beak, the head, and the belly. I've made sure that for every color I intend to use, I would set aside at least three shades of it. In order to properly mimic the shading style, I'll be using a standard watercolor brush, specifically Running Color Edge. What you want to do is build up your shadows, but don't make it a smooth transition from light to dark and vice versa. You want a lot of contrast or difference in tone. Picture yourself dividing the colors into at least three sections, the white or highlight, the lighter tone, and the darker tones. The divisions don't have to follow a specific path. For example, the character's highlight follows a standard rule of positioning itself opposite of the shadow, but the shape of it can sometimes be erratic or random at times. I've looked at a bunch of official art and I couldn't really find a clear-cut pattern for the highlights. But this is probably due to the way the art was preserved. This is good for us because it gives us a lot of leeway to experiment. Now that we have our highlights and shadows, we can use our darkest color for the drop shadows, which would go underneath prominent features of the character. With our Pokemon, I've chosen to place a drop shadow underneath the beak, underneath the head, and underneath the tail. I'm actually going to break this out further in a future section, so keep watching if you want to know. During this video's production, newly scanned concept art had been discovered, providing us with our first look at the authentic watercolor style. If you wanted to learn this style instead, it's as simple as making a few subtle changes to the shading process. The techniques will be the same, but the contrast between the tones won't be as drastic. That means taking the time to build a smoother transition between them. The palette is also going to be slightly different. The colors you'll be using will have a lower saturation or intensity, which means the final drawing will be a bit grayer than usual. The most common art programs will allow you to adjust this to your liking, so you'll be all set. Pick a bee. The old school anime style is what we see when we watch the classic Pokemon TV series from the 90s. And you can think of the style itself as sort of an amalgamation of 80s and 90s animation. I can even go as far as to say that most cartoons and anime of that era share the same art style. The shows from that time were made using animation cells and displayed through a CRT television, giving us that retro aesthetic we all recognize. We have here our two characters from before, our trainer who has grown a bit older, and our newly evolved Pokemon. Right now they're presented in the style of an animation cell. Before the age of digital art, animation was done frame by frame by inking lines onto transparent sheets and painted underneath. I'll break this one down first. 
The lines are going to be thin and textured. The reason I recommend a textured edge is because we'll be applying some filters on the finished drawing, and a textured line makes the filters look better. If we're drawing a close-up like a portrait, the line weight will be slightly bolder and actually fluctuate a bit, just like with our previous art style. In terms of tapering and sharp corners, round them out a bit. The color of the line itself will be very close to black, but not truly. You can even use a very dark brown or blue color if you want. For certain segments of the line work, there exists a concept that we call selective outline, something I learned in pixel art, in which you color certain lines differently in order to emphasize tapering, blending, or fading. With our character here, some of the lines that would normally lead to a taper, I've selectively outlined them with a different color instead. I've personally selected lines that overlap their skin, and I've changed the color to a dark brown, basically a darker version of the color underneath. I've excluded prominent features like the face because you want that to stand out anyway. In terms of color, animation cells use their own palette of paints. For convenience, I've collected high-quality photos of Pokemon cells and selected colors from there. The type of shading you'll be using is cell shading, or cartoon shading, in which you use a flat color for the shadows. For our characters, I've marked a path along the contour, a line that marks a change in depth and lighting, and filled it in with our darker color. For me personally, I define art style as line, color, and shading. So when I say a lot of old cartoons and anime share an art style, I'm saying the types of lines and colors they use would overlap. Production techniques are the same, but the character designs themselves differ. This would involve their actual shape, their proportions, and overall figure. And it requires prior knowledge of concepts like figure drawing, anatomy, and perspective. So I'm going to cheat and give you the bare minimum you need to make your human characters look like they came from the Pokemon anime. And it involves the face, which is frankly all all you need to sell a style. If we were to use a normal head shape for the face, the jawline would be smaller and more angular, a standard for a lot of anime. Eye-wise, our character's pupils will resemble a thin oblong shape with an angled line placed one-third of the way from the top. Optionally, you can place a second angled line halfway to two-thirds in. The corners of these tangents will be rounded, and the top will be filled in with white, acting as a highlight, and the bottom filled with your eye color of choice. If there's space in the middle, fill it with black. As for the shape of the eyes, you have a few options to choose depending on the character. The first the shape is similar to a tall pentagon with the topmost lines acting as eyelashes and the bottom line acting as a base. These eyes can be seen with female characters such as Misty. The next shape is a cropped oblong often used by male characters such as Ash Ketchum. The third shape is a scaling triangle and I've noticed that it's commonly used for antagonistic characters such as Team Rocket. The final eye shape is Brock. Using a single eye as a unit of measurement, the eyes would be around two spaces apart from each other, and around one space away from the edge. The nose would be represented by two short lines situated along the base of the eye. The line weight of the nose will increase as the two lines meet in the middle. Whether or not the ridge of the nose is curved depends on you. Your character's mouth consists of one line and may include a break in the middle if you want to mimic the curvature of lips. It will sit right below the start of the jawline. This is only scratching the surface of character design, acting as a basic structure for you to adjust as you see fit. Now that we have the animation cell art style out of the way, we can finally get to the fun part, filters. I've come up with a flexible combination of effects that would give me a pretty decent CRT TV effect. So allow me to introduce you to Dog Shoddy's recipe for old school anime. Let's begin. First, flatten the image. On the program I'm using, I've selected Blur, which is self-explanatory, and Sharpen More, which basically tries to undo the blur. Repeating this process at least once makes the image look compressed. Duplicate the layer, and use Gaussian Blur set to 40, which would create a very strong blur. Turning the opacity of that same layer down to 40% creates a cloudy effect over the image. For our final effect, create a layer right on top and generate noise, which is meant to replicate the graininess of old TV sills. Generate the noise and convert brightness to opacity, effectively erasing the white portion, allowing you to convert the color to either dark blue or dark brown. Then set the layer to overlay and bring down the opacity to 50%. And there you have it, my tried and true secret formula, revealed. art style for this video is Ken Sugimori's modern Pokemon style, which can be seen as early as Generation 3 up until our current generation of Pokemon games. Although the character designs of both the Pokemon and the humans slightly change between these modern entries, the basic rules of the art style remain consistent. The trainer we followed all this time is now a regional champion, and their starter has reached their final evolution, a Gryphon. 
The lines for the style function very similarly to the scanned watercolor style that we learned in the beginning. In fact, the line work of the style is a more refined version of what came before. To summarize, use medium weight lines that slightly fluctuate in order to replicate ink line work, just like the first generation. Broad strokes would naturally lean toward a heavier weight, and the overall texture of the lines will still be rough, but only very slightly. The techniques I previously mentioned, such as rounding the corners of the intersections and tangents, they can be applied here too. When selecting the colors for my trainer, I deliberately chose to pull from characters that are specifically gym leaders. The colors for my Griffin Pokemon, like before, are taken from both Spiro and its evolution, Firo. For each base color I picked, I've included one lighter color for the highlights and two shades of darker colors for the shadows. Shading in this style is pretty straightforward, because like before, we'll start out using a single tone for cell shading. Unlike the previous style, we'll be more detail-oriented when it comes to adding shadow. For example, sections like the fingers, the ears, even small accessories have their own depth to them, and if something is underneath them, they'll have their own drop shadows. Imagine an umbrella and a light shining above it at an angle. The top part of the umbrella is going to block some of the light, casting a shadow underneath. When you look at your drawings, you'll eventually notice that there are certain parts that act as that umbrella. Looking at it that way really simplifies how you choose the locations of the drop shadows. A shading part that's prominent in this art style is something I like to call a contour stroke. I've briefly mentioned contours as a mark that illustrates a change in depth and lighting. A stroke is a fancy way of saying a line. So when we put it together, it would be a line that goes alongside the curve of a shadow. If we had the base color of the character and the color of the shadow, the color of this stroke would be in the middle. The size and shape of the line would resemble that of a thick brush stroke, and it would act as a transition or a bridge between the two colors. For the highlights, let's start with the hair. Most of the time, the highlight is going to be one large brush stroke that curves along the surface. I've seen more detail-oriented situations where the highlight would follow individual strands, but this is way easier. We'll also be using what we just learned and placing a stroke in between the actual highlight and the base color. The shape of the brush would be a bit similar to watercolor. The bangs of the hair, or any tip for that matter, can also be highlighted as you see fit. For the rest of the character, you can use your brush to lightly brighten the sections opposite of the shadows, and you can also use the highlights to break up large spaces of flat color. Thanks for watching, and thank you guys for your support on my last video. The next star style has already been chosen, but let me know what you want to see next in the comments down below. Till next time, stay creative.